नमस्ते निकेतु जी थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बीइंग पार्ट ऑफ दिस सीरीज अप्रिशिएट वेरी मच थैंक यू सो यू हैव टॉक्ड अबाउट योर चाइल्डहुड एंड हाउ द एक्सपीरियंसेस ऑफ द विलेज लाइफ इन्फ्लुएंस्ड यू Uh, you have also talked about how learning that there is nothing in life to be feared only things to be understood so in what ways this would connect with your earliest memories of non violence well i think uh, <clears throat> from childhood i was uh, i was very violent <laughs> and uh, when my little sister Uh, was born two years younger than me. A few days after she was born, uh, I didn't know why I did it. But my mother, when I was about thirteen or twelve or thirteen, she told me without scolding me. I felt, but she was telling me that when my mother was feeding her, a few days after she was born, I looked at that and ran out and with a little uh, pebble, a stone, threw it to my sister. and it caused bleeding on her face and uh, i have no no memory of that but when i was so old you know my mother said to me more than once she said you know you did this to your little sister and i felt that she was telling me that you are capable of being cruel and uh, in her voice and uh, i if my mother has scolded me and condemned me i would have become defensive and make it worse but anyway i think that uh, went into me to realize that uh, you have come to this world the, there is no future for violence but we commit violence immediately to protect our little kingdom our little interests and if that is not faced it becomes your life i think that i would say is the my first awareness i was not aware that i couldn't say so in so many words but later on i see that to be the beginning of my fight against non violence <laughs> so <laughs> the concept started there i think i think that, that that is my my first answer and um, about uh, nothing is to be feared I think when I read Gandhiji's autobiography, that was when I was on my way to join college to do my BA in Madras Christian College, Tambaram. Um, I read uh, first. I I I heard somebody quote Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, saying at the beginning of the twentieth century, he he said, "If anyone born in this century." if he thinks he has come to relax he must realize he has come in the wrong century <laughs> i arrived in college feeling quite shattered really there is no future for selfishness <laughs> I, I, my life i want to do relax so by all means um so that was one then soon after that i read gandhi ji's autobiography and as a young college student i couldn't put it down because i came from my my uh, nagaland situation uh, where things had become very bad started to become very bad and i was full of hatred bitterness against the, the people of india and here the, the people i had condemned so much with my friends and said all kinds of things made me shed tears i i, I just cried because the story of total honesty truthfulness and his selflessness and his you know his boundless so i think that that that's uh, that, that's when i begin to realize that um the only future is in learning to uh, learning non violence and i think this thing about his 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 call for fearlessness because i i always knew myself to be a very cowardly very fearful man fearful of about everything and uh, being dominated by my other friends also mm. but deep down a hunger to be courageous and gandhi ji so talked about total fearlessness i think there was a thing that profound uh, attraction when did you first encounter gandhi ji at what age and how 
that was my, in, uh, you know, before that, in, uh, in 1946 or seven, my uncle Fizo, they went and met Gandhiji in uh, Bangi Colony in Delhi. That was uh, really in June, I think, 1947. And uh, they went and Gandhiji received them and they say we have come because we, we Nagas have come because we want to be free. Uh, Gandhiji said, you must become free. I became free long ago. So they said, uh, well, Gandhiji, we have crossed the street to cut the city to come to this colony. Delhi is fully in, under the British, uh, British everywhere, British army officer, everything. So how can you say you are free? She said, my freedom has got nothing to do with where the British are. And so Pizzo and his delegation said they didn't know what to say. And uh, so that was, uh, they came back and said, he said, and when they said that the governor at that time has said that if we violated his, uh, his state, uh, his order, uh, he would use violence to suppress the Nagas. So Gandhiji said, if anyone will shoot the Nagas, I'll, be, I'll come and be the first to be shot by Indian bullet. So they, we, they came back and said to our people, with Gandhiji, we can solve everything. So that was my first hearing of what Gandhi, Gandhi meant. Uh, and yet, in the 50s, your own father was a political prisoner. Mm -hmm. And your maternal uncle, the great leader, uh, Angami Zapu Fizo, as you just mentioned mm -hmm. him, was also mm -hmm. a freedom fighter for the Nagas. Many of your mm -hmm. fellow students and your peers uh, joined yeah. the militant, the armed militant movement. <clears throat> yeah. So how and why were you drawn towards the moral rearmament movement? Can you please share that yeah. story of how you yeah. found your way there? Yeah. I, first of all, my father was not a political prisoner. They, the police told him he was a political prisoner. He had nothing to do with politics. He was just a, a some medical service doctor retired. And soon after that, he was put in jail, mainly because he was Fizo's brother-in-law. Anyway, that was my father. I think when soon after I re arrived in my college, uh, I was wrestling with all these things. And my friends had at home, had in, that was 1955, my friends had started to go to the jungle, getting trained, and everybody was, you know, the slogan was very clear, and the Naga story was very clear and all that. And I was going away to a very safe, secure place in South India to do my BA, and uh, I felt guilty I was away. And the, but these people of uh, initiatives of change, Moriam and MRA, I met some of them. Two of them were my professors, and the people came and stayed with them, and that's how we the discussion started. And uh, they uh, they talked about change for everybody. Uh, that if you want to have uh, a, a new world, things have to change in this world. I was very clear about that. Then the change has to start with you all the time, every day. Otherwise, you make people react and nothing happens uh, because people will see that you're part of the problem. And uh, so that how I was, uh, I was, I said to myself, I am somehow, I didn't say so, but I somehow deep down, I began to feel that, okay, my friends are in the jungle. I respect their sacrifice, willingness to do everything but I'm in the right place. That kind of a thing took hold deeply. And uh, I said, what will my friends, my people say I'm far away from them? But I said, deep down, I'm in the right place. Uh, you know, what I'm hearing from these people and what I read in Gandhiji's uh, biography, I meant to take this seriously. And so in due course, according to like what Gandhiji did, getting, uh, talking about the, the thing he had stolen and he returning the things like that. I heard the same thing from these people of MRA, that you put right by just returning what you had stolen or being apologizing for where you had hated others, or if you had uh, done wrong thing, be honest about that. 
be in the light. Uh, that sound appealed to me as being the most right thing to do for me at that time. So I wrote a long letter of, to my father who was in jail, uh, telling him exactly where I cheated him regularly. Oh, <laughs> he was a very simple man. I made my father think that I was the finest son of his five sons because I was, uh, I was sending accounts every month. Uh, of my expenses. But the trouble was my accounts were all full of lies. So when I told him and the things I was, something I had done, I was very ashamed of. My father read my letter and then my father replied to my letter and said, um, thank you, my dear son, thank you for your courage and your honesty with me. I, then he went on to say, I know what you, my children, feel, have felt about the way I have treated your mother. I promise I will treat her differently. At that time, I said to myself, my gosh, I never, when I wrote my, to my father, I had no idea that he was going to, to deal with what was wrong with him. <laughs> uh, but I was deeply moved because there are so many memories of our family being uh, very big and my father's salary to support our family. It was, as a doctor, it was about 400 rupees a month. And my father in the kitchen where we all sat together, my father will, at the end of 10 days, the first 10 days, all my father's salary disappeared in the shop, Nepali shop. <laughs> and my father will say very harsh thing to my mother, saying that you don't know how to uh, handle my money, where's my salary? And, and again and again, and we used to, just sit there feeling miserable. And uh, so when my father says, I've treated you, how I've treated your mother, I will treat her differently. You know, and when she, he came out, he really treated her differently. But I, what, I've, what happened to me was, this is something I am being shown, that if I deal with what is wrong in myself, um, the rest is in God's hands, you know, which I later discovered is from the Gita. <laughs> you do what you know is right, your duty, leave the rest to him, don't worry, it's not your business. Here was a little instance of me telling what I was, uh, very difficult to tell my father. I did my duty and my father started to do his duty. And I said, at that time, I said, here is something I cannot treat lightly. It's a very small thing. It was not changing the world or anything, but it was showing me that this is the most important, you're getting your uh, roadmap, so to speak. And so with more and more confidence, I said, I'm the right place. My friends are in whatever they are because of their feeling for our people, I respect them fully. But at that time also, you see, in addition to this experience with my father, I started to deal with my selfishness because the first time I tried to be silent and listen to the still small voices I was told, I didn't hear any voice from heaven or anything like that. But the thought that came to me was, you are a very selfish man. I just wrote it down. <laughs> you love nobody. In fact, you hate everybody and jealous. I wrote those simple words and when I shared with uh, fr some friends, they said, you are very courageous, you are very honest. <laughs> anyway, that thing about selfishness, I realized that if I was away from my people, they are doing something for our people, okay, our aspirations, very important. But if I'm not going to be fighting the jungle like them, if I have no selfishness to, in myself, I, if I am, uh, if then I'm, I'm, I have the full authority to do what I was going to do. I think that's how I became more and more convinced that I was the right thing. And uh, from then on, I have just uh, all my life worked with initiatives of change, more realment. Did you physically stay at Panchgini, the Panchgini Center for many years? Or were you doing that work uh, entirely in Nagaland and in other parts of the world? Yeah, I was in Panchkani, you know, 68 Panchkani was created, 1968. 
I was there for about 25 years. And then, but meantime, I was in and out. I worked all over India uh, from, uh, from the first, you know, from those early days. Uh, all the states of India, except Jammu and Kashmir and Tripura. And I hope at least I can see Tripura before. <laughs> yeah. I, I went all over India. That's how, yes. And what was the nature of this work? Can you describe what was the activity uh, that you were leading in this, in, in all parts of India? Well, I think it was to, to, to understand what was going on in, in a situation, any situation I went to with, with my friends and uh, to be able to share what little I was learning. Mm. And because what else can you give? Because they were, they were facing much more difficult problems than uh, I was. And so again and again, I found that you only have what you have, uh, the steps you have taken to deal with what is wrong in your life and in the world, in your own life. That only you can share with people. Otherwise, you are just uh, people immediately sense you you are talking right. only. Right. That's that's how that's uh, that's that's the thing I did all, all the time. I think as part of the some specific program we were conducting. Yeah. These uh, situations that you are describing were they always situations of conflict? Uh, sometimes, but other others were. Uh, people invited us to come in in some specific situation where they anticipate <laughs> problems arising, getting worse, okay. uh, or they sense that uh, there are a lot, a lot of things uh, wrong in India, and that meant that we need to give attention to injustice, uh, all the things that, that have been wrong for centuries, and I discovered that more and more, and because people like-minded uh, posi uh, mind, positions with people, that kind of thinking, we have to do, to deal with these things that have been got wrong for a long time. I think on that basis, we were in, invited to different situations, different places by different people. And what were some of the successes in this? What were some of the reaffirmations that you gained in these experiences? as well as the challenges where uh, you, you know, met great difficulty. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the, we, in Panchkani, we, we went out to industries, um, the different places uh, in India, in Pune, Bombay, uh, like that, uh, Madras, to invite people to our seminars, industrial seminars. It was for teamwork in industry and a new philosophy for uh, industry. Uh, so that kind of thing we were trying to conduct. So we went to invite people, brought them. And I think I sense that here, not immediately, but through the lives of people, workers and their wives, engineers, uh, you know, management, union leaders coming with their families to our seminars, that in a completely different situation, they were, we were searching together uh, the thing that meant the most to them and what is wrong in the world. And I felt that that way we were getting to the lives of people who were handling industry. And I find that it's only through people that things happen, not, not big ideas. That is one, and then, that's why I felt we were we were doing something constructive, and it was getting into the uh, thing that in the woodwork of India, and the you know in in northeast India the creation of Meghalaya state, uh, Meghalaya the demand for Meghalaya state to separate from Assam it, it was becoming violent, and the the uh, I remember an editorial in the paper in Calcutta said. Unless the differences, the feelings, the react, the anger between the Assamese and the hill people uh, was not was not uh, to reach an amicable settlement, uh, Meghalaya, the hill states of uh, Assam, will follow the path, the Naga path, and then said it will be a second Vietnam. Notice it will be a second Vietnam. That kind of thing was going on, 
but through the invita in, invitational request of uh, Meghalaya tribal leaders and from the Assam side, we were invited to come in and it's a long story short, uh, a long story. It resulted in the creation of Meghalaya without bloodshed and violence. And I believe that was a, a, a you know, very significant uh, instance of a conflict being resolved because of the removal of distrust through one political leader being completely honest with the other political leader. Both said that things were going wrong, but the connection was created when the, the Kasi leader, Stanley Nichols Roy, said to Chaliha, the chief minister of Assam, I have not bothered to think at all about the, your need, your, your, uh, the needs of the Assamese people. I have thought only about my own people in the tribal, saying that we are tribal people. We don't need to think about the majority people. But I realized that you are concerned about your own Assamese people. I've come to say, I'm sorry, I've not thought of your people. I'm only thinking of my people. That kind of thing, be, uh, you know, re, uh, remove the distrust. That was the real problem. And after that, they started to plan together and enabled Indira Gandhi to create the state without bloodshed and violence. And uh, I think it was a, it, that was a great achievement. Indeed. In this context, how did, with this whole background of your own work and your convictions, how then did you come to see the Naga struggle and the yeah. Naga demand for independence? How did, say, uh, you know, over the last 40 years, how have you addressed that in your, in your nonviolent frame? Yeah, I felt that, you know, the, the most uh, important issue is uh, human aspirations. Because human aspirations is in an individual, in, a, in the people of a village, a tribe, or people who are just emerging from the traditional past. Nobody had heard of them like us. Ancient civilizations like India, China, the Persians, <laughs> all that. Aspiration is in everything. Uh, but the world has started to come to think that the aspiration of the established powers is the only thing that matters. The others are troublemakers. And I felt that my people, very small, but we have, stayed, we have been honorable and truthful about our aspirations. And simply told uh, when, when the British left that we said we were not part of you because we fought the British, we did not fight the new India. The new India never came to us. We were up in the mountains, they, nobody came to us. Only the British and the missionaries came to us and we fought against the British and they defeated us. So they made us part of the, the Indian British empire uh, becoming a district of Assam. That's how we became part of it. So before the British left, we were said we were not part of this new India. So when we said that we are not you, you're not us, we are not against you. We're just saying being honorable about ourselves, truthful. I think that's the that's a meaning of the Naga, Naga struggle. And um, so I felt that as we must be truthful about our what is what we really feel. At the same time, we must be worthy of our aspirations. We cannot, you know, use our aspirations to make life impossible for our neighbors, our northeast neighbors. And when we do that, we also destroy ourselves. And so I begin to see that we have to have a settlement where we get India to understand our position and, and then say that we also understand India's position. But in this, we have to work out a settlement that will be, that in which both sides understand and respect one another. And I think that taken a long time. I think the, uh, I've, across India I've worked and here, uh, the Delhi policemakers attitude is that these are troublemakers that Territorial integrity is more important than these human beings. A very important governor of Nagaland told me, I mean, this problem of yours can be solved if all the Nagas are removed from the villages scattered all over the wild places and taken them to Bombay, Delhi, spread them all across India, the problem will cease. 
and India can do that. So I, I said to myself, he's a policy maker. He it creates policies in Delhi. He's one of those. And they tell the politicians to do this or that. And he said he thought it was nothing wrong with that. I mean, that kind of thing will just make people more and more determined to say, okay, we will give our worst if that is your attitude to us. I think that is where the problem is. So I, I've come to feel that if we can have real honesty on our side and real truthfulness on our side about where we ourselves have started to destroy ourselves, we have destroyed the process. And the, when the process goes wrong, the outcome is never right for anybody. Not for us, not for our neighbor, not for India. It's the same for everybody. Keep the process clean, the outcome be all right. I think that is where uh, I begin to see that uh, a lot of things have to be work, worked out. It cannot be something that just satisfies ourselves. No, not possible. But it also cannot be something in which India will say, you, you do not matter, you, you are just not, not relevant. Only your boundary, your land is relevant to us. For say, look, it's policy, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's why I think we have to work to, 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 to establish the right, uh, you know, for this philosophy of life, yeah. the right uh, thing for proper growth for everybody. Proper growth, I believe, is the fundamental need. So what is today the status of the armed militancy in Nagaland? Is that still a reality that you have to deal with? And, and the younger people now, say people who are under 30, uh, do they still want to be a different and a separate country? I think the, there is a vast feeling that we deserve to be a separate country. And that over 60, 70 years of militancy, uh, people have realized that we cannot defeat the Indian army. It's a rather huge army. <laughs> and so, and so, but what about those people who have died in the jungles, who have died in the villages for, for our, we simply said our aspiration is that we are also a people. We have our own history. And uh, we are not uh, part of it. We are not Indians, uh, just as you are not Nagas. It's from our perspective, we are very small, but that's how we look at India. We are not Chinese, we are not Indians. Uh, when you say you are not us and you are not us, we are not against you, please understand that kind of thing, you see. So the younger generations who have gone to study in Bombay, Delhi, all over the place now, they said, well, I think it is a hopeless problem. Our elders have started for us. And, uh, but when they go to Delhi, they begin to sense that many times, things are improving, I think. Many times they say, hey, who are you? Are you Chinese? Are you so-and-so? And so they said, we, we have an impossible crisis. We have no solution and therefore just make money and enjoy life, that kind of thing. But that doesn't work. Always the aspiration issue comes up, identity issue, aspiration. Therefore, I feel that only through being truthful, learning to be truthful to the still small voice, uh, we will know how to uh, you know, uh, let aspiration play its right part. Mm. That's how I see. But, but things can go very... Things can go very wrong because, you know, we have things have gone so wrong within our own society. Inter-tribal rivalries. Uh, we have done terrible things to one another. In addition to whatever the Indian Army may have done, ha have done. Uh, so we have to say now the position. The what needs to be done is whatever has gone wrong. Let us not make it worse. So that's when nonviolence comes in. That's when a body like the church has to say, whatever has gone wrong, we will not, we will nonviolently stop any violence, that kind of a thing. Because if things are made worse, we'll go down the black hole. Yeah. And everybody will go in. So that is where government of India's policymakers have to understand that is the India's great role to make sure nothing goes wrong worse. On our side, we have to reduce the wrongs we have done for so many years. And that's where, that's where it means 
raising or you know helping the uh, you know building nurturing the lives of individual who will just be truthful yeah then they, they generate hope in society that it is possible for the right thing to be done mm. you know the, the right thing to be done is undoable that is the the, the position everybody takes and that but makes it undoable say, by believing that right. you make it so that's right. So we have to produce the lives of individuals whose lives will shine like you know little candles. It is possible. It is possible to be the change you want to see in the world. I, to my mind, that's the best definition of IOC. Be the change you want to see, because Gandhiji had made it by that he made it some excitingly doable. But when you start, you you you, you discover you are doing the greatest thing, <laughs> most most tough thing. But it always is the sense that it is doable is generated when that that be the change you want to see. I think that's what we have to do. Yeah. In traditional Naga society, were there any mechanisms for resolving conflict that could today inform the efforts, the striving for nonviolence? Because many pre-modern systems had very creative, uh, uh, many pre-modern societies had creative mechanisms for conflict resolution also. Is there anything yeah. that you would like to add from that? Well, I th yeah, I think we saw it was things went wrong within villages and within tribes in the, in the old days. Uh, now it's it, the whole state, the whole northeast is affected when something goes wrong. In those days, when things went wrong in the village, if I have uh, done the wrong, you know, kill somebody, uh, we, uh, you know, intentionally or by accident, immediately a third party will come in and take over and say that we will, we will handle this conflict and told the, the one who has done the wrong thing to go away from the village, to, uh, you know, to send off on exile, so to speak. And, or if that man who has done the wrong thing will ask for protection, the third party clan or a group will say, yeah, usually clan, say, we are protecting this, he has done wrong. Now, if the one who has been harmed will do anything to, to this, then you are taking the law into your own hands. We will protect him and, and, and fight you. So that kind of a thing always worked. And then they will say, okay, let us work out how this uh, uh, conflict is to be resolved. And on, on, then if also something went wrong between tribes, one tribe will come in and say, we have to resolve this and we are responsible to get both sides to talk to one another or the, create a connection. Roughly, I think that's, that's the one that has worked uh, down, this, down in the past. But that today in the new situation where everything has gone, uh, you know, uh, um, mixed up, uh, that is that is proving to be very ineffective because nobody is nobody recognizes the authority of the other one in the new crisis. So we have to, we we are we have been uprooted by the huge impacts of changes that have come and impacted us. And so, in the new in the new crisis, it's as if uh, you know, in a in a huge storm, the soil is all made soft and everything is washed away, and there is no no nothing rooted uh, uh, that is standing. So, in this new situation, we have to create the new ways of solving our conflicts. You have done work. Uh, for nonviolence in different parts of the world as part of your uh, engagement with initiatives for change. Today, when you look at how the world is in 2021, 22, what is your, uh, how hopeful are you? I mean, what are the possibilities for nonviolence and what are the challenges? What makes it difficult? Uh, in an overall, I'm saying here, if we look, at the world as, yeah, yeah. as a whole yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and you may have a different reading of different societies also but I'm keen to mm -hmm. know what insights 
uh, you know you have on that because there is uh, you know there is a cynical view that advocates of non violence tend to be a bit dreamy or you know that they are not fully recognizing the realities that we are facing but i have i know that you do face those realities so in that context what insights would you share i think um, think i think can go really very wrong all of the world i think um but the world is also beginning to uh re recognizing that uh, there is no future in just doing the wrong thing for a wrong thing done um as gandhi ji said that uh, an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind or something like that the world is just beginning to understand those things um but the burdens of wrongs in justice is done as such that it may be like a huge lens like in nagaland Uh, but i think there is a desire for what is right in every human heart as uh, some sometimes it, it, it doesn't seem to be true but in deep down the desire for what is right is there and if we can uh, those of us who say we believe in it and say i'll do what is right and uh, then of course we are required to do what is right not our way not but his way in god's way <laughs> i think that's when we do what is right our way that's when we create hell <laughs> but when we do what is right his way that is the inner voice way the still small voice way and i feel that uh, we have to just keep uh, increasing that work through the lives of people who become really different and who are satisfied and happy i mean i think when people are satisfied convinced and happy uh that's the most powerful force in the world i think um uh, to my mind that's the, uh, that's that's my only hope for for, for the world but and in my in my situation yeah but today uh, do you feel that uh, there is an atmosphere a social and culture cultural atmosphere uh, that leads more and more people to believe that being satisfied is a material condition more than it is a state of mind yeah i think that is i think that is uh, i mean look at what uh, politicians are doing everywhere they want to be uh, they want to sacrifice anything uh, uh, thing that is decent in order to win in the next election um but when people start to i think this is where she we say peace edu peace education something is going on people say well i'm not satisfied doing what what is what is for my advantage i think more and more of that is increasing i believe um i mean what is happening in south africa after nelson mandela and tutu and so on uh, south africa is a completely different south africa right now but there is a fight that is rising and ordinary people say well we ourselves have to be responsible we can't just say we have elected this somebody to do what should be done for the country uh, the, the legacy that was handed down by mandela and so on gandhi and mandela these people we can't say that for that society to work we can't say somebody is responsible i the, here in nagaland the ordinary people say that we have elected somebody uh, for to run politics we have our religious leader in the churches and so on Uh, we ordinary people what can we do we'll just be only selfish in the, on our ordinary scale that results in our election becoming so expensive because the politicians will have to buy our votes and so we are begin to realize that we are ordinary people are making society undevelopable i think more and more i can say this is we want development but we are making development impossible because the, the <coughs> resources available are used up just to to make the election uh, you know uh, finance the election and the politicians say we have no money because <laughs> because of this because of that you see and the politicians are the ones who get blamed and a lot of it is true but the ordinary people have to realize that maybe they are they are more responsible for things that are going wrong 
So say all of us are responsible, that kind of thinking has to come out. And I think in all this, uh, we need, uh, you know, interesting uh, example. I'm very much interested in the work you are doing, for example, with conviction and joy. I said to myself, this kind of thing, the people I've met across India like you, say that India will produce what is needed for the world. India will not go uh, quietly into the, into the night. India is not used to, uh, you know, India has produced people like Gandhi, Narsi Mehta, and, and Tukaram. And therefore, I, I say I have, I have, you know, unkillable hope. Uh, yeah, then I, I, I want in my own little way to the end say this is the only way for the world and for, for my people who are just emerging from our you know long centuries of isolation we are very new we are just looking at what's going on and many are saying that we have no role to play mm. but if each one of us say I'm responsible for my little society to do what is right we will find that we are part of what's going on in the world. That, that's how I see. Yeah. What is uh, currently your preoccupation? I, uh, because I have a feeling that you're the kind mm. of person who never retires. Uh, <laughs> no, so I'm, what is... I'm, what, what keeps you busy these days? Yeah. I, you know, a lot of uh, people come. I'm now, uh, I'm just this year, I'm, I'm 86. Mm. And uh, but a lot of people from villages, from friends come just to discuss. Uh, we live in a beautiful home built by a friend of ours, mm -hmm. who just ra raised the resources really and gave his his uh, skill completely free, uh -huh. and rallied people. Uh -huh. So we live in a house that I hope will come one day. I, I um, would love to. Yes, a lot of people come. We and so my wife and I say we are the chokidars of this place, <laughs> and but people come to to just discuss. The name of our house is a house for listening. It's in our language is called Karanyaki. That means a house for listening. And people say, "What is this?" I say, well, this is it. You know, when I'm explaining a house for listening, my wife says, "You know, the, the name of the house of listening." So. Don't be, be too long in explaining the meaning of the house. <laughs> anyway, I think what I'm doing is uh, uh, meeting people uh, so much of the time and uh, using my own experience, limited experience, but I'm convinced it's true, um, sharing that this is possible. If I can change, you can change, that kind of thing. And people are always interested in the little or whatever things I have put right. Yeah. They say, if this man can do it, there's hope for me immediately. I did that kind of a thing, I think, uh, is, is, is I. And I found that uh, because if we want nothing for ourselves, if really we want nothing for ourselves in every sense of that word, people say that, the no, no, trust is 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 not changed, mm. and therefore I find that I can meet uh, the leaders of all the factions, the Naga militants, um, and people say so. Mm, just because I I want them to find the same experience as I have, and I want nothing for that for them, uh, that is a very powerful message. Mm. So in a sense, there's nothing uh, tangible at the same time. It's very, <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, shall we say, um, it takes up all your time. <laughs> it does, it does. So in closing, um, yeah. actually this is great advice for young people, but in closing, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, because a lot of young people want to walk this path. I think they have an instinctive uh, draw. They feel drawn to the striving for nonviolence, but they also think that in our current situation in India, in the world, it looks sometimes very difficult. So what are some of the inner qualities that you would recommend or you would suggest they cultivate? 
how can they find that still small voice within? I think, uh, I don't know what to say, it's a very big question, but I find that no matter, you know, who, you may be a brilliant person or not a brilliant person like me, uh, everybody becomes aware of what's going on it's not, and one is not happy. That's the world we come to. It's a very, very damaged world we all come to. And if I can say that I'm not happy with what's going on, therefore, what should be done? I think it's the most question, the question everybody should learn to ask him, himself or herself. What must be done? What needs to be done? And the next question, answer, question is, who will do it? Is it somebody or not me? I think that becomes an immediately exciting uh, uh, challenge. And for me, as I look back, that unhappiness with the world I had come to, starting with me throwing my stone at my little uh, helpless sister and <laughs> becoming aware in due course that uh, there's no future in, <laughs> in doing this all the time. <laughs> you, and you, and there's no future, you see. There is no future in doing what is wrong, selfish, cruel. I mean, everybody understands that. But then what is the thing that will be uh, uh, sustainable, right, and right for everybody? There is a hunger for that. And so I think I, all the young people I uh, talk to, I'm saying, what should be done in our society? What should be done in our village? Tomorrow I'm going to talk to my villager tomorrow a meeting. Uh, as the oldest man, <laughs> I'm going to ask, okay, are you aware of what is going, what needs to be done? I'd like to have a time or quiet to, to, for them to say, what is going on in our village, in Nagaland, in India, Northeast India? Are you happy with it? And then what is it that you're unhappy? What, then they say, what must be done? Then who should do it? Is it the 60 MLAs and the chief minister in his cabinet only? Or is it the, the village council leaders? Or is it the so-and-so, you know, so who, are, who are paid higher salaries? Then there's no hope, there's no future. <laughs> but if you will decide to say, what must be done, I am responsible no matter how uh, small I am, how poor I am, how, how clever or unclever I am. I think there is an, a, an, a sensational experience, you know, excitement, adventure immediately. So build on it, build on it. To my mind, uh, that is the most powerful question. Thank you so much. Well, it's a uh, real honor to meet you. Real honor and pleasure to meet you, to have a sense that there's a search horn in the great, great old India, one of, one of the oldest amazing civilizations. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.